This is WBSM On Demand. Players. The time is now to talk about everything happening here on the South Coast and beyond. It's time for South Coast Now with Chris McCarthy. Call into the show at 508-996-0500 or send Chris an app chat message or open line voicemail on the WBSM app. It's the most interactive show on the South Coast. It's South Coast Now. Good morning. Welcome to the third and final hour of the program. I'm Chris McCarthy, and we have Congressman Jake Auchincloss, who represents a, a, a big part of Bristol County, cities of Taunton, Fall River, parts of them anyway, and town of, Far, town of Freetown. And Congressman Auchincloss, a Democrat, and he is doing a lot of work on the issue of communist China and our relationship with them. So we're going to go right now to the Congressman. Thank you, Congressman Auchincloss, for joining me. Chris, thanks for having me on. Um, look, you're always available. You have a fantastic staff, and I do appreciate it. So you are on this joint committee uh, confronting China. Explain some of your work you're doing and in, in, in the importance of that committee. Yes, this has been a dysfunctional term of Congress under uh, a deeply polarized environment with House Republican leadership in disarray. But this bipartisan select committee on China has been an oasis of thoughtful policy work in an otherwise pretty barren desert. And what we're focused on is long-term strategy regarding how the United States outcompetes China, who is our top adversary of the 21st century. And it's useful to reflect on what's at stake here. Why do we care? And to me, it comes down to values. The United States was founded on the principles of the inherent value and dignity of every individual, yes, sir. and that freedom is a birthright. The Chinese Communist Party, by turn, views individuals as pawns of the state. They do not recognize inherent value or dignity in the individual. They view individuals as being of service to Xi Jinping. And Xi Jinping has been clear that in the 21st century, he wants China to dominate, to upend the rules-based order that America helped architect after World War II, that has helped spread peace and prosperity the world over, and instead replace it with a might-makes-right regime where Russia's invasion of Ukraine would be uh, just one in a series of dominoes to fall. So we need to win. And here's the good news is I think we are going to win. I think we can win. And most of the important questions are actually not about China. They're about America. They're about whether we double down on what we do well as a country, whether we enforce the rule of law, celebrate our democracy, whether we invest in science and education, whether we have an entrepreneurial and dynamic economy as opposed to a state-run sclerotic economy. These are all things within our control. We don't have to worry about what the CCP is doing on any given day, what the Politburo is deciding. We control our destiny, but we have to have bipartisan conviction in the kind of policies that invest in the American people. We're speaking with Congressman Jake Auchincloss uh, on his work in, on the committee on, on the threat from China, the very real threat, as he's pointing out. Um, one of the major things, it's still really unsettled, is COVID-19. Um, where are you making, are you getting any information on how the Chinese are responsible ultimately for COVID-19? And where do you come down on that? Yeah, I mean, whether it was <clears throat> lab leak, whether it was it came from the, the wet market in Wuhan, I think what's undeniable is that the CCP chose secrecy and obfuscation over global public health repeatedly, not just in the initial weeks, but in the initial months. They lied. They lied to global public health researchers who were trying to connect uh, collect rather genetic information to be able to track the spread of the virus, who were looking for collaboration on the ground uh, with patient zero. And they consistently chose the political interests of the regime over the well-being, not just of their own citizens, but of people the world over. And it costs lives. And that needs to deeply uh, undermine their credibility on all, all future endeavors going forward. Because when we seek to work with them on issues like transnational 
countering of terrorism or climate change or debt burdens for developing countries, uh, they have a serious credibility deficit that they're going to have to prove uh, they can overcome. We, uh, yeah, we, we, I'm glad you brought up the fact that, it, it, you know, their credibility and the amount of people that, that they ultimately killed. Um, I, I want to include in that, you know, Mike Cassidy was a New Bedford police officer, member of the Marine Corps like you have been, and the mayor of New Bedford, Fred Kalis, the past mayor, they both were killed with COVID-19 by the communist Chinese. So when we talk about it, you know, just to put a human face on it or a voice to, to those people, they left behind people that, that love them. And uh, it's a, our community is weaker because those men are not here anymore. COVID-19 was a, a tragedy and the deaths, as you say, of beloved community members and also the school closures that were so deeply disrupting to our students who are still recovering from the learning loss, from the interruption in their socio-emotional development. Uh, so it's going to take a huge amount of work for us to, to move forward as a country. Uh, and we, we have got to invest in our biotech and life sciences economy, not just so that we're ready for vaccine development, uh, if we are struck with another virus, but also because it is jobs and cures uh, here in Massachusetts. The, the biotech economy is a huge, huge economic multiplier for good jobs, not just R&D jobs for PhDs, but biomanufacturing jobs for high school and, and associate degree holders, uh, uncovering cures from everything from ovarian cancer to sickle cell disease to heart disease. Well, one of the um, things that, that I'm concerned about, and it's it's no small thing is that the amount of Chinese unaccompanied males, right? They're not coming with white women and children who are, who are coming into the country now. I know veteran Asian American journalist Gordon, uh, Gordon Chang, for instance, has said that he believes they're here on a sabotage mission. Do you have any insight into why so many Chinese males are now crossing the border in the United States? And do you have suspicions about whether they're here really to better their lives or to better the Communist Chinese Party? Well, we have to be careful about ascribing motives to people based on their nation of origin or their race, color, or creed. I, one of the promises of the United States is that regardless of the circumstances of your birth, you should be able to improve the condition of your life through your own work ethic and, and talent. And for people who are coming to the United States, we want them to come legally, of course. We want them to be vetted, but we want them also to contribute to the economy and to their communities as, as people have in America for 400 years and as my great-grandparents did here in Massachusetts coming to Chelsea first. Uh, the, my, my supposition is that many of these Chinese are coming because the Chinese economy is imploding and youth unemployment in China is skyrocketing and their prospects for marriage are very limited because of the one China policy. China has a demographic disaster on their hands. They're 1.4 billion people on track to be 500 million people by mid-century because of the one child policy that they instituted and because they are not creating economic opportunities for their youth. So while we need to be concerned about China as a true peer adversary that challenges our values, we can't view them as a 10-foot tall uh, behemoth. We have to recognize that they have their own significant challenges and we can beat them, but it really is about decisions we make here at home. Do we respect rule of law? Do we invest in science and education? Do we uphold our entrepreneurial dynamic economy? Um, what do you think of the China? I, I know you spent some time in, in Central America as a member of the Marine Corps, so you're familiar with that part of the world. And what do you think of their push into, into for instance, Cuba and Nicaragua by the communist Chinese? It's deeply concerning. I, I think we're looking at really a, a corrosion of parts of the Monroe Doctrine and how CCP is engaging with Latin American and, South, and Central American countries. A lot of times with digital infrastructure, actually, they're trying to sell them a lot of the the cloud and tech services that underpin not just their economies, but their civil society as well, things like election uh, integrity. Um, same thing is happening, by the way, in Africa, maybe even on a bigger scale, where they're building hard infrastructure, ports, railroads, electrical plants throughout Africa. Yeah. Now, here's the good news, though. It's not just all doom. The good news is that the Chinese Communist Party doesn't actually have a great product to sell. You know, when they, when they build these products in these countries, oftentimes it's shoddy worksmanship. It's done with Chinese labor, not with host country labor. Um, and it is done in exchange for debt that oftentimes they use as a, a, a tool of, of leverage over the host country. The United States has a lot to offer. And we just have to be at the negotiating table. We've been absent, I think, too much over the last decade. One of the things I'm doing in Congress is trying to push for reauthorization of, of a 
uh, a series of trade deals with the global south, with countries in Africa and Latin America, that one, lower prices for American consumers, but two, just help the United States show up and, and be engaged with these countries, countries like Nigeria and Brazil that are growing fast, that are important partners for us, and that we need to be on our side, not the Chinese side. Um, Jake Auchincloss is the congressman. He, he represents part of Bristol County, and we appreciate him joining us. Jake, um, when it comes to espionage, the Chinese are, are certainly using it. We use it against them, and, you know, it's, gathering intelligence is part of uh, statecraft. But how much espionage do you think is being conducted against our government from the, from the shores of the United States? By the Chinese Communist Party? Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, significant. I think that they are pump, uh, launching both nation state and state affiliated attacks against not just the United States, but a range of, of European and other allied nations. Let me tell you, though, what I'm actually most worried about. It's not it's not the espionage. It's not the cyber attacks. Those are of concern. We have good defenses. I'm worried about what they're doing right out in the open. And that's two things. One, they are exporting fentanyl to Mexican drug cartels to then be imported into the United States, and they are laundering Mexican drug cartel money. And two, they uh, own and control TikTok, which has become a massive ideological uh, distortionary effect on especially, especially the youngest generation of Americans. Those are two things that are happening right out in the open that we need to vigorously contest. We've got to force a sale of TikTok so that's U.S.-owned and domiciled, and we need to severely crack down on their exports of fentanyl to the drug cartels. So those, those are two great things because I'd like you to recommend to my – well, do you think people in, my, in the sound of your voice should be using TikTok or allowing their children to use TikTok? Or is it just better to take it off your phone? I don't use TikTok. I wouldn't let my kids use TikTok. I'm always hesitant, Chris, to – lecture my constituents. People are grown-ups. They're going to make their own decisions. But right. What I would do is encourage my constituents, though, to, to fully understand the tool that they are using. And the tool that they are using is owned, controlled by entities that are themselves owned, controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. And the algorithms at use and the data policies are not in Americans' interests. Go, circling back to the fentanyl, we've obviously lost a lot of people here in Bristol County, all through Massachusetts, all through the United States. Um, when, we when you mentioned it, are you telling us, and, and I, I believe it is, but that it is an actual policy of the Chinese Communist Party to export fentanyl and to undermine the American population with, with drugs? Yes. And it's important to have the history here. Yes. The Chinese, to them, their century of humiliation was the 19th century, and it was characterized by the Opium Wars, where, and this is a shameful episode, Britain and, and some of British allies were insistent on, on importing opium into China. Yes. And so China views opium and opioids very, very as core to its century of humiliation. And I think there is some historical symmetry to what is happening here. They view their exports of fentanyl as a relatively inexpensive way to destabilize American society and also as part of their century of rejuvenation to help repair the humiliations of the opium wars. And it's, it's a red line in the sand. I mean, 100,000 Americans are dying mm -hmm. uh, because of these fentanyl exports. The fentanyl is being laced now with Trank, a horse tranquilizer, which is causing the, uh, the impairments to be harder to, to resuscitate. And uh, it's being done in open collaboration between the CCP and the Mexican drug cartels. Uh, and it's going to require um, very, very tough diplomacy to get them to stop those exports, despite their claims that they are, that we haven't seen enough action. We're speaking with Congressman Jake Auchincloss, um, talking about his work on China. And I, 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 look, first of all, I really appreciate your optimism on this because I, I believe you, you're correct. The United States can defeat anybody and it doesn't even have to devolve into open combat. Really, we can win on the battlefield of ideas. But Taiwan, obviously, is a major, major focal point. What do you think about our work on Taiwan? Is Taiwan doing enough for themselves? Or are we doing enough for them? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, Taiwan is doing a lot more for itself than it previously was. One example, they used to have mandatory four-month enlistments for all uh, able-bodied males in Taiwan for their armed forces, and they have now extended that to 12 months and, and made the training much more rigorous. They are procuring and deploying Western arms in a more sophisticated way as part of what they call a porcupine strategy. And, and what I mean by that is um, a, they're trying to have defense in depth, where it's not just a bunch of exquisite very expensive missiles and other hardware. It's also just arming civil society in depth so that in the state of an invasion where the Chinese are trying to do an amphibious landing, cross the mountains, going to urban combat in Taipei, they're facing a, a deeply entrenched, relatively well-trained civil population, which is, I mean, that's a tall order. That is, a, that is the hardest thing you can imagine in a military operation. So the Taiwanese are doing more. We have to do more, though. Uh, and in particular, we got to pass this national security supplemental. The Senate passed 7030, a bill to fund Taiwan, to fund Israel, to fund humanitarian aid for Gaza, and to fund Ukraine. And that is a good investment. Those are all countries that are fighting on the front lines of the free world against tyranny, totalitarianism, terror. And they're not asking Americans to go fight. They're trying to have that fight themselves. They just need the firepower. I know I, I, know I told you be about China, but I think you brought up the Ukraine and Israel, two countries that I believe we should be supporting with, with arms and finances, finances. But there is an American problem, you know, with that. Some people don't believe it. Um, give a plug, if you will, for Ukraine, supporting the Ukraine and supporting the Israelis with weapons and with uh, financial assistance, if you would. For Ukraine, appeasement doesn't work. The lesson of the 20th century is that when a murderous dictator says they want territory, uh, and that they will stop there. They don't, and they won't. Uh, we need to provide the Ukrainians with the weapons that they need to defend their freedom and their sovereignty, because if we don't beat Russia in Ukraine, we may have to beat Russia in the heart of Europe as NATO allies. Uh, and it's been a good investment. We've spent, for less money than Americans spend on soft drinks every year, we have cratered half of Russia's military capacity. We've doubled its border with NATO, and we have sent a message not just to the Kremlin, but to Beijing and Tehran, that America's here to stay in the 21st century, and we are going to stand with freedom and democracy the world over. And on his aid to Israel? Israel's our closest ally in the Middle East. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. And on October 7th, they were attacked by a terrorist organization that committed atrocities difficult to conceive of. And Israel um, has long been a recipient of U.S. military aid, which has not just benefited Israel, but also benefited the United States. And in particular, the Iron Dome, which is a missile defense program, keeps U.S. soldiers safe as well as Israeli civilians and soldiers. Um, and so we need to work with our Israeli ally and with Arab nations to ensure that the Israeli military has the tools it needs to defend the Jewish democratic state, that the Gazans have the humanitarian aid that they so desperately require, and most of all, that we get to a negotiated settlement where the hostages come home and where we can transition to post -gov post-war governance in Gaza without Hamas. We've been speaking with uh, Congressman Jake Auchincloss. Jake, before I let you go, is there anything else you'd like to uh, give your constituents a message here in Low in Bristol County? Uh, anything else you'd like like to add to the conversation? Well, we've been talking a lot about geopolitics. Let me just bring it home for a second here and say that, um, you know, I'm working hard on an issue of particular passion for me, and that's drug pricing. Um, last Congress, we passed a measure to empower Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Starting this year in 2024, Medicare Part D beneficiaries, the um, are going to see their out-of-pocket costs go down, particularly those with uh, cancer diagnoses who have, require expensive medications. They're going to see a direct savings at the kitchen table. Next year, nobody on Part D will spend more than $2,000 over the course of the year on their medications. And I'm working now with colleagues uh, on both sides of the aisle to, to take on the health insurance companies and bring down those costs even further. Congressman Arkin Kloss, I really appreciate you joining me. You have a tremendous staff. I appreciate them arranging it. Have a great day, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Likewise, Chris. Take care. Have a great day. All right, stick, folks, stick around. We have Diana DeZaglio coming up next, so stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. 
Welcome back to the program. I'm Chris McCarthy. Uh, I want to thank uh, Congressman Jake Auchincloss for joining us. Um, it's great when you can get a congressman here on to, who answers unscripted questions about his work. Um, so I really appreciate the congressman for doing that. And you heard it, folks. Your children, your friends' children, and some of you know other adults who are being poisoned by the communist Chinese with fentanyl. It's a deliberate poisoning of American youth and adults by the communist Chinese. And we know what they did with COVID, right? We know what they did with COVID. We lost, um, you know, I lost a great friend in Fred Kalis, the former mayor of New Bedford. And um, Mike Cassidy was a New Bedford police officer and a former Marine. Um, I, I, of course, had a little bit of a scrape with COVID-19 as well. So it's nice the congressman is focusing on that. And um, I appreciate his candor that they are poisoning this community. The communist Chinese. They're communists. You can trust a communist to be a communist. So we're, um, we'll have Diana DeZaglio joining us. She's the state auditor. And I think she's doing a marvelous job up there. She wants to audit the state legislature. They are resisting her on that. She's a Democrat. But she's doing the work of all of us. I know that you had Republicans, Democrats, and Independents out there gathering signatures for her. She won because she paid attention to the greater New Bedford area. And um, I th- she'll be back here, obviously, for visiting. But she's joining us by phone. Uh, she'll be joining us here in a few minutes. Stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Chris McCarthy. We're now going to be joined by our state auditor, Diana DeZaglio. Good morning, Diana. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks so much, Chris, for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, you're always welcome here, and, and, the, and the voters of this area really, really appreciated you, and they appreciate the work you're doing. So give us an update, Diana. How are things going in your years there at the state auditor? Well, I appreciate you asking. I did just finish up my first year. I can't believe... Uh, that it has been a year. Uh, feels like just yesterday I was running around in your area uh, asking for votes and telling people about what our campaign platform was. Uh, but it has been just over a year since I was inaugurated. And we've been doing the work that we said we were going to do. We're auditing the MBTA. We're working on an audit of the legislature. We're auditing the taxpayer-funded non-disclosure agreements. And we are working to increase transparency and accountability equity and accessibility across state government. Uh, And we can't do that without folks like you and all of those listening, sending information to our office and partnering with us and keeping in touch with us. Uh, That's why I love being on the community and love coming on the radio because it gives me an opportunity to connect with people uh, and then to hear back from them. So again, thanks so much for the opportunity and uh, look forward to chatting. So Diana, you have been on this um, quest to audit the state legislature, of which you used to be a member, very sure. It wasn't that long ago that you were a state senator here here in, in Massachusetts. Prior to that, you were a state representative. Prior to that, you were a staffer. So you know what's going on up there. How is the battle yeah. going? Yeah, thank you for asking, Chris. I appreciate it. Yes. So for those listeners, you know, my name is Diana DiZoglio. I am the current state auditor, the people's auditor, the chief accountability officer for the state of Massachusetts. And I was recently elected uh, a little over a year ago, like we were talking about. But before I was elected as your state auditor for the entire state of Massachusetts, I did serve in the state legislature alongside of your fantastic state delegation, I have to say. He's doing a great job representing uh, your communities uh, up on Beacon Hill. But I did work in the state legislature as a state representative for six years and then as a state senator for four years. I was also a legislative aide before uh, I ran 
for, for office in the first place. And what I saw in the legislature was a lot of really great things happening on behalf of our communities. Uh, but I also saw some areas where we were really in lack and those areas uh, included the areas of transparency and accountability. Our state legislature here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is one of the least transparent and accessible and accountable state governments in the entire nation, according to most good government groups. And as a state legislator, I would often get up and challenge the leadership of the House of Representatives and the state Senate on issues pertaining to transparency and accountability. Uh, as a legislator, I was very public about being frustrated with not having enough time to even read a bill that we were uh, expected to vote on. And I had said many times, if, if legislators aren't even given a day to read and reflect upon a piece of legislation, you know, that's over 100 pages, for example, uh, what does that say about access for those that we represent in our communities? What it says is they don't have access. You don't have access. Uh, if your legislator doesn't have access to what they're voting on, you know, you can rest assured that that's, that's you know, uh, coming out or coming down to the folks in their district that they represent. It's impacting them. So I challenged the leadership uh, many times during those years that I was in the state legislature. And when I campaigned for a state auditor, I talked about the need for reforms in our House of Representatives and our Senate. And I talked about how it was very challenging to get access to information, how legislative leaders prefer to do business under a cloak of darkness. Uh, wasn't the most popular legislator, as you can imagine, uh, when I was saying those things. But they needed to be said. And that's what folks in my communities uh, were telling me that they were struggling with. They said they wanted access. They wanted a seat at the table where the decisions were made before and not after those decisions were already made on their behalf. Big decisions about laws that impact all of us. Big decisions about the state budget that impacts all of us. Uh, so as state auditor, and when I was running for state auditor, I committed, yes, I will audit the state legislature. I was asked on numerous occasions if I would commit to auditing the entity uh, of the House of Representatives and Senate. I think it's very important that elected leaders on Beacon Hill be accountable at all times to the people as the Constitution states. And right now, unfortunately, that's not happening. We have legislative leaders who are re refusing to produce documents, refusing to participate in this process, uh, and refusing to tell us how they are spending our tax dollars. Again, under that cloak of darkness on Beacon Hill, that is unacceptable. The, that's our, uh, those are our tax dollars. It is the people's house. It's not the politician's house. And it's time for you know the people to unite uh, and come together to make sure that legislative leaders on Beacon Hill know that we expect transparency and accountability from them and we expect them to let us know how they're using our tax dollars. So I am conducting an audit of the legislature, but because they are refusing to comply, and it's the Speaker and Senate President, I just want to be clear with everybody, uh, none of your state legislators locally have access to the information that we are seeking in the auditor's office. I know because I'm a former legislator. Right. Uh, but the Speaker and Senate President uh, are the only ones really that have access to uh, be able to get the information to the auditor's office that we need. And they are the ones who are putting ro up roadblock after roadblock. They, it is coming from their offices not to talk to us. Uh, employees are hearing that they shouldn't be speaking with us. And, you know, that's no way to run state government here in Massachusetts. You know, we should be opening up the doors and letting the sun shine in, uh, not pulling the curtain and sweeping things under the rug, right? So uh, we are demanding at this point, uh, as a people, we have a, a, a group of people, transparency advocates, who are tired and fed up of the shenanigans and who are demanding increased accountability from our legislative leaders. And uh, because they are refusing to produce those documents, we are working on a ballot question. And that ballot question still needs to most likely co connect, collect another 12,000 plus signatures uh, this spring in May. So I am going to ask if anybody's listening today, please go to dianaforma.com, click on the ballot button. And if you're willing to help us get signatures to make sure that we can put this issue on the ballot to make sure that legislative leaders are, uh, you know, required to comply. They already are required to comply, but, you know, they're saying that they don't think that the law applies to them. So we want to make it crystal clear. If you'd like to support our ballot question to ensure legislative leaders comply with this audit, we need your help. We can't do this without you. 
please go to dianaforma.com and click the ballot button and help us get this issue on the ballot this November so that we can all go and vote for change, vote for transparency, vote for accountability from our elected leaders on Beacon Hill. We're speaking with Diana DiZaglio, our state auditor. Um, really, what what a, what a great... Um what a refreshing, really, approach that you're, you're, you're asking people to partner with you, to give you support, because you're going to support them to try to get this done. Give the website again how people can get involved with your petition drive, which is a fun thing to do. It's dianaforma.com, and you click on the ballot button, and there will be a sign-up sheet there, and you can contribute or you can uh, volunteer uh, however you want to be helpful in this cause, this is something that benefits all of the residents of Massachusetts. It will help to increase access to what's going on at the state house, what's going on in state government. Uh, audits are there to help. They are not there to hurt. Uh, you know, if somebody, the, the, the issue here is, you know, this constant refusal of receiving an audit, one has to wonder what they're hiding, right? Correct. When we go into these different state entities, uh, you know, it, it's not, I certainly am not going to suggest that these state entities love getting audited, Chris, right? right? Because it is, you know, challenging. And if you, if you can imagine if you were to get audited personally, right, you might Mm -hmm. be a little bit frustrated or have a little bit of anxiety about it and, you know, be trying to make sure that you can find your paperwork and produce the documents that are requested, right? right? Well, my office, we don't audit individual taxpayers. That's not the job of the state auditor's office. We don't audit you personally as taxpayers. What we do in the office of state auditor is we audit the government for you. So just like you wouldn't be permitted to, you know, uh, put your hand up uh, at the IRS if they came in their, you know, Department of Revenue and say, you know, you can't audit me. Uh, do you know who I am? Right. Uh, they wouldn't accept that. That would not be an acceptable answer, right? You have to follow the law. So our office audits state government. And when we hear from legislative leaders that they're outright re- refusing just to let us see how they're spending money and to see the documents that we're requesting, that that is problematic. That is not okay. And one has to wonder what they are hiding if they're not willing to comply with what every other state entity complies with. Every other state entity, like I said, they might not get out the pom-poms when my auditors from my office go in, but they understand that we are there to help to make sure that T's are crossed, I's are dotted, that money is being appropriated in the right way, that taxpayer dollars are not being wasted or abused, right? Mm -hmm. And they comply. They comply because they understand that that's the law and that this office is there to make sure there's integrity in state government. So we expect the same from our legislative leaders uh, who are not above the law. We're speaking with Diana DeZaglio. She's our state auditor. Um, Diana, in addition to the legislature, one of the big expenses we've seen, really was an unanticipated expense, is the migrant problem here. And a lot of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars have gone out the door. Um, are you going to take a look at that, that, where the money's being spent, if there's any waste, fraud, or abuse there? Yes, yes, absolutely. And thank you for asking. I know a lot of folks are concerned. Folks have been reaching out to my office. Uh, And, you know, look, this administration and our state legislators have their work cut out for them in navigating, uh, you know, navigating all of this. I will say that our office and the Office of State Auditor uh, will have decision making authority about how these issues are addressed. Uh, What we can do is we can look at spending and we can look at how those dollars are being spent to help ensure that as this influx of dollars is going out there, that there, again, you know, say the word integrity, that there's integrity in ensuring that the tax dollars are being spent the way it's said that they are being spent. So we are including that review actually as part of our uh, larger audit of housing across the Commonwealth, because as many working families know, uh, a lot of folks are struggling to find a place to live right now. It's very expensive. Uh, a lot of folks are you know, uh, worried about, you know, their, their future, their children, uh, or, you know, their parents or, you know, anybody in their family who, you know, uh, may, may be looking for a place right now. Uh, housing is not just a challenge here in the state of Massachusetts. It is a nationwide problem, but, you know, if we can work together on addressing this housing challenge through the auditor's office with all of you, I believe that, you know, we can do our part in helping to make recommendations on how to address these challenges. So we're looking alongside 
of that audit of the emergency assistance shelter, shelter system. Like we said, we're also looking at issues pertaining to zoning, issues pertaining to transit-oriented housing, issues pertaining to state-owned land, uh, and other issues relevant to housing, such as issues with housing authorities. Uh, we look at we look at that from a statewide perspective. Uh, so, you know, we're going to be doing a comprehensive review of housing in the Commonwealth. We hope that it's helpful. It's by no means going to be a, a save all, right? Right. Uh, but it is it is one additional tool in the toolbox. And like I said, we're we're working to do our part and take a look at those those financials and some of the uh, processes and procedures that are being utilized in. Uh, the Department of Housing and Livable Communities and make sure that, you know, things are being done uh, to the best of the state's ability. So we're speaking with Diana DeZaglio, our state auditor. Um, Diana, you, you, you were in the, in the state Senate for a couple of terms. And so we are now going to become an MBTA community. We really are now. The train's about to roll into the greater New Bedford area. You know, you're in the Senate. You worked with Senator Montigny, who was, who was really the big champion. He's the reason, along with Charlie Baker, the train is coming to New Bedford. But we're going to be an MBTA community. So you're auditing the MBTA. What, what, should, uh, what, what, what are your audits telling you so far? So according to the federal uh, government accountability offices, generally accepted government auditing standards, mm-hmm. a long phrase right there for y'all, uh, we are not uh, uh, at, at liberty to talk about the audit as it is ongoing in detail so as to not compromise the ongoing audit and investigation. It's the uh, rules passed on to my office. It's been quite challenging, Chris, I have to say, because as a senator, <laughs> got up every time I wanted to say something and just said it. Uh, so I've had to pull back a little bit, but what I can tell you is that uh, we are very much looking forward to, in coming months, releasing that audit in full, uh, with full transparency about what we looked at, how we looked at it, what we found. Uh, we released the full audit uh, you know, and, and make that completely transparent to everybody about what we did find. I can say, uh, generally speaking, we are looking at safety issues and we are looking at performance related issues and we are taking a look at some contractual issues, some contracts. Uh, so generally speaking, that's what we're looking at. We invite people to give us, uh, you know, whatever information they have. If they want to pass stuff on to the investigators and the auditors in my office to incorporate into that, that audit. You know, we welcome that and uh, and look forward to to uh, reporting that out uh, hopefully sooner rather than later. It is a, a comprehensive review, so it's taking some time, obviously. Uh, but again, doing our part, making sure that we are working to make sure the MBTA is held accountable. It is unacceptable that we've seen what we've seen with the MBTA. Public transportation in Massachusetts has never properly served the residents of the Commonwealth, I would argue. Uh, and yes, Senator Montigny, amongst uh, you know the rest of your legislative delegation, uh, I remember them championing uh, some of these things in 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 the legislature when I was serving with them, you know. And and we want to make sure that the things that your elected officials have championed on your behalf, we want to make sure that there's accountability in those systems because you know a lot of people worked hard, advocates, uh, volunteers, you know, everyday working people just to voice what their concerns were, and they deserve to be heard. We should not have trains catching on fire. We should not have constant derailments. People shouldn't have to fear for their life, you know, when they get on a train, when they're just trying to get to work or bring their child to a doctor's appointment. Uh, They should be able to, uh, you know, get to work safely. They should be able to have a reliable transportation system. And, you know, we want to make sure these working families who, who do ride the T, who do ride public transportation, who do take the buses, uh, so on and so forth, that they have access to, you know, resources that are that are safe and reliable. And even if you don't take public transportation, we obviously care about our working neighbors who do, right? We want to make sure that they're protected. So we need accountability. And also we all pay into the system, right? So the billions of dollars that we are sending out of our hard-earned paychecks in those tax dollars uh, that go back into those state coffers when they're sent to the MBTA, we deserve accountability. And we deserve to know that those dollars are being invested wisely in an efficient and an effective manner. So we are absolutely auditing the MBTA to help identify any areas of waste, fraud, and abuse. 
uh, but with a special focus on safety and performance. We've been speaking with Diana DeZago. Diana, I want to thank you for joining us, spending about 20 minutes with us here on the air. Uh, speaking of the Greater New Bedford area, again, I appreciate it. We look forward to having you here in studio. Um, have a great ta- day, and uh, we'll, we'll speak to you soon. I'm so grateful, Chris. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon. Thanks, thanks. That was, that was State Auditor Diana DeZaglio, who really is doing our work up there, and I, I do appreciate her. And again, she's always receptive. We have we have a direct communication link, the two of us. She's always receptive to um, my uh, my invitations. So stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Chris McCarthy, and boy, we've had a great day. Um, we talked about really the, the 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 chaos and the violence that is happening here in New Bedford. Uh, I know some people want to diminish it, but maybe just because they're so used to it, or they're in the chain of command and they and they don't want to be responsible. I I, I just don't get it. I mean. If I was an elected official in the city of New Bedford, I would rise to the challenge. I would say there's no other problem as big as young men taking guns, illegal guns, and driving around shooting at each other. That's insanity. Even saying it out loud bothers me. It bothers me. Do do you realize what outsiders think of New Bedford? People are driving around with guns, shooting at people. That's insanity. And if you're going, if you're willing to tolerate it through some psychological break or a block in your mind because you're used to it, you're like you have Stockholm syndrome. You're like. The girl in the closet, tied up, falling in love with your kidnappers, right? Don't be that girl. Don't be that girl. All right, so we'll have the mayor here tomorrow. He'll be here in the studio at 11 o'clock. want to appreciate Diana DeZaglio for joining us, Congressman Jake Auchincloss for joining us, but most importantly, all of you who called the program today. Many of you had to wait on hold for quite a while. Some of you actually didn't get through before you had to go back to what you were doing. But I'll be back tomorrow. In the meantime, Barry will be here after me. WBSM is really committed to keeping democracy in place here in southeastern Massachusetts. So embrace it, use it. Frequent our sponsors, frequent our open line at 508-996-04. If you never called before, it's a great way to get started. Think about it overnight. Meet me here tomorrow morning. 9 a.m., I'll be back here in the studio. In the meantime, you can practice with Barry, 508-996-0500. It's never too late to get started being a member of your community, all right? When you talk to me or you talk to Barry, there's a lot of elected officials that can hear your voice. Don't 